free my children! Oh my god! Hi guys, welcome back to Old Book Gold. I'm KG, and we shall be continuing our journey through Star Wars Dark Force Rising. But before we begin, I have some exciting news. Old Book Gold is now going to be moving from a monthly update to a bi-weekly update. That's right, every other week will be a new episode of Old Book Gold. We hope you enjoy the new schedule. And now we shall start with Chapter 13. For a single heartbeat, Leia stood at the Matrak, her muscles frozen with shock her mind skidding against the idea as of walking on ice. No, it couldn't be. It couldn't. The Grand Admiral had been here just last night. Surely he wouldn't be coming back again. Not so soon. And then, in the distance, she heard the faint sound of approaching the repulsor lifts, and the paralysis vanished. We've got to get out of here, she said. Chewie? There's no time. Cabarak called, sprinting to them with Chewbacca right on his heels. The shuttle must already be in sight beneath the clouds. Leia looked quickly around the room, silently cursing her moment of indecision. No windows, no other doors, no cover except the small booth that faced the wall genealogy chart across from the Duca. No way out. Are you certain he's coming here? Leia asked Kabarak, realizing as she spoke that the question was a waste of breath. Here's the Duca, I mean. Where else would he come? Kabarak countered darkly, his eyes on the Matrak. Perhaps he was not fooled, as we thought. Leia looked around the Duca again. If the shuttle landed by the double doors, there would be a few seconds before the Imperials entered where the rear of the building would be out of their view. If she used those seconds to cut them in escape hole with her lightsaber, Chewbacca's growled suggestion echoed her own train of thought. Yes, but cutting a hole isn't the problem, she pointed out. It's how to seal it up afterward. The wicked growled again, jabbing a massive hand toward the booth. Well, it'll hide the hole from the inside anyway, Leia agreed doubtfully. I suppose it's better than nothing. She looked at the Matrak, suddenly aware that slicing away part of their ancient clan duca might well qualify as sacrilege. Matrak, if it must be done, then be it so. The Nogri cut her off harshly. She was still in shock herself, but even as Leia watched, she visibly drew herself together again. You must not be found here. Leia bit at the inside of her lip. She'd seen that same expression several times on Kabarak's face during the trip from Endor. It was a look she'd come to interpret as regret for his decision to bring her to his home. We'll be as neat as possible, she assured the Matrak, pulling her lightsaber from her belt. And as soon as the Grand Animal is gone, Kabarak can get a ship back and take us away. She broke off as Chewbacca snarled for silence. Faintly, in the distance, they could hear the sound of the approaching shuttle. And then, suddenly, another all-too-familiar whine shot past the Duca. Scimitar style bombers, Leia breathed, hearing in the whine the crumbling of her impromptu plan. With Imperial bombers flying cover overhead, it would be impossible for them to sneak out of the Duca without being spotted. Which left them only one option. We'll have to hide in the booth, she told Chewbacca, doing a quick estimation of its size as she hurried toward it. If the slanting roof that sloped upward from the front edge back to the Duca wall wasn't just enough for show, there should be barely enough room for both her and Chewbacca inside. Will you want me in there as well, your highness? Leia skidded to a halt, spinning around in shock and chagrin. 3 PO. She'd forgotten all about him. There will not be room enough. The Matrak hissed. Your presence here has betrayed us, Lady Vader. Quiet! Leia snapped, throwing another desperate look around the Duca. But there was, no, but there was still no other place to hide. Unless... She looked at the star dish, hanging over the sm star dish hanging over the middle of the room. We'll have to put him up there, she told Chewbacca, pointing to it. Do you think you can? There was no need to finish the question. Chewbacca had already grabbed three PO and was heading at top speed toward the nearest of the tree trunk pillars throwing the frantically protesting droid over his shoulder as he ran. The Wookiee leaped upward at the pillar from two meters out, his hidden climbing claws anchoring him solidly to the wood. Three quick pulls got him to the top of the wall, and, with the half-hysterical droid balanced precariously, he began to race hand over hand along the chain. Quiet, 3 PO, Leia called to him from the, from the booth door, giving the interior a quick look. The ceiling did indeed fall the slanting roof, giving the back of the booth considerably more height than the front and there was a low bench-like seat across the back wall. A tight fit, but they should make it. Better yet, shut down. They may have sensors going, she added. Though if they did, the whole game was over already. Listening to the approaching whine of her pulse lifts, she could only hope that after the negative sensor scan from the previous night, they wouldn't bother doing another one. Chewbacca had reached the center now. 
Pulling himself partway up on the chain with one hand, he unceremoniously dumped the 3PO into the star dish. The droid gave one last screech of protest, a screech that broke off halfway through as the Wookiee reached into the dish and shut him off. Dropping back to the floor with a thud, he hit the ground running as repulsor lips outside went silent. Hurry! Leia hissed, holding the door open for him. Chewbacca made it across the Duca and dived through the narrow opening, jumping onto the bench and turning around to face forward, his head jammed up against the sloping ceiling and his legs spread to both sides of the bench. Leia stood in behind him, sitting down the narrow gap between the Wookiee's legs. There was just enough time to ease the door closed before the double doors a quarter of the way around the Duca slammed open. Leia pressed against the back wall of the booth in Chewbacca's legs, forcing herself to breathe slowly and quietly, and running through the Jedi sensory enhancement techniques Luke had taught her. From above her, Chewbacca's breathing rasped in her ears, the heat from his body flowing like an invisible waterfall onto her head and shoulders. She was suddenly and acutely aware of the weight and bulge of her belly, and of the small movements of the twins within it, of the hardness of the bench she was sitting on, of the intermingling smells of Wookiee hair, the alien wood around her, and her own sweat. Behind her, through the wall of the Duca, she could hear the sound of purposeful footsteps and the occasional clink of laser rifles against stormtrooper armor, and said silent thanks they'd scrubbed her earlier plan of trying to escape that way. And from inside of the Duca, she could hear voices. Good morning, Matrock. A calm, coolly modulated voice said. I see that your third son, Kabarak, is here with you. How very convenient. <laughs> Leia shivered, the rough rubbing of her tunic against her skin horribly loud in her ears. That voice had the unmistakable tone of an imperial commander, but with a calmness and sheer weight of authority behind it. An authority that surpassed even the smug condescension she'd faced from Governor Tarkin aboard the Death Star. It could only be the Grand Admiral. I greet you, my lord, the Matrix voice mewed, her own tone rigidly controlled. We are honored by your visit. Thank you, the Grand Admiral said, his stone still polite with the new edge of steel beneath it. And you, Kabra Clan Kimba, are you also pleased at my presence here? Slowly, carefully, Leia eased her head to the right, hoping to get a good look at the newcomer through the dark mesh of the booth window. No good. They were all still over by the double doors, and she didn't dare get her face too close to the mesh. But even as she eased back to her previous position, there was a sound of measured footsteps, and a moment later, in the center of the Duca, the Grand Admiral came into view. Leia stared at him through the mesh, an icy chill running straight through her. She'd heard Han's description of the man she'd seen in Merker, the pale blue skin, the glowing red eyes, the imperial white uniform. She'd heard, too, Vilia's casual dismissal of the man as an imposter, or at best a self-promoted moth, and she'd wondered privately if Han might indeed have been mistaken. She knew now that he hadn't been. Of course, my lord. Kabarak answered the Great Animal's question. Why should I not be? Do you speak to your lord, the Grand Admiral, in such a tone? An unfamiliar Nagori voice demanded. I apologize, Kabarak said. I did not mean disrespect. Leia winced. Undoubtedly not, but the damage is already done. Even with her relative inexperience of the subtleties of Nagori's speech, the words had sounded too quick and too defensive to the Grand Admiral, who knew this race far better than she did. What then did you mean? The Grand Admiral asked, turning around to face Kabarak and the Matrak. I... Kabarak floundered. The Grand Admiral stood silently, waiting. I am sorry, my lord. Kabarak finally got out. I was overawed by your visit to our simple village. An obvious excuse. The Grand Admiral said. Possibly even a believable one. Except that you weren't overawed by my visit last night. He cocked an eyebrow. Or is it that you didn't expect to face me again so soon? My lord, what is the Nargiri penalty for lying to the lord of your overclan? The Grand Admiral interrupted, his cool voice suddenly harsh. Is it death as it was in the old days? Or do the Nagiri no longer prize such outdated concepts as honor? My lord has no right to bring such accusations against the son of the clan Kimba, the Matrax spoke up stiffly. The Grand Admiral shifted his gaze slightly. You would be well advised to keep your counsel to yourself, Matrax. This particular son of the clan Kimba has lied to me. And I do not take such matters lightly. 
The glowing gaze shifted back. Tell me, Cavarack Clan Kimbar, about your imprisonment on Kashyyyk. Leia squeezed her lightsaber hard, the cool metal ridges of the grip biting into the palm of her hand. It had been during Kabarak's brief imprisonment on Kashyyyk that he'd been persuaded to bring her here to Onager. If Kabarak blurted out the whole story... I do not understand, Kabarak said. Really? The Grand Admiral countered. Then allow me to refresh your memory. You didn't escape from Kashyyyk as you stated in your report, and repeated last night in my presence, and in the presence of your family and your clan dynast. You were, in fact, captured by the Wookiees after the failure of your mission, and you spent that missing month not meditating, but undergoing interrogation in a Wookiee prison. Does that help your memory any? Leia took a careful breath, not daring to believe what she was hearing. However it was the Grandmal had learned about Kavarak's capture, he'd taken that fact and run in exactly the wrong direction with it. They'd been given a second chance, if Kavarak could hold on to his wits and poise a little longer. Perhaps the Matrak didn't trust the stamina either. My third son would not lie about such matters, my lord, she said before Kavarak could reply. He has always understood the duties and requirements of honor. Has he now? The Grand Admiral shot back. A Nagiri commando, captured by the enemy for interrogation, and still alive. Is this the duty and requirement of honor? I was not captured, my lord. Kabarak said stiffly. My escape from Kashyyyk was as I said it. For a half a dozen heartbeats, the Grand Admiral gazed in his direction in silence. And I say that you lie, Kabarak Clan Kimbar, he said softly. But no matter. With or without your cooperation, I will have the truth about your missing month. And whatever the price was you paid for your freedom, Ruck, my lord, the third Nagori voice said. Cabra Clankimba is hereby placed under Imperial arrest. You and Squad 2 will escort him aboard the troop shuttle and take him back to the Chimera for interrogation. There was a sharp hiss. My lord, this is a violation. You will be silent, Matrak. The Grand will cut her off. Or you will share in his imprisonment. I will not be silent, the Matrax snarled. A Nogori accused of treason to the Overclan must be given over to the clan dynasts for the ancient rules of discovery and judgment. It is the law. I am not bound by Nogiri law, the Grandmal said coldly. Kabarak has been a traitor to the Empire. By imperial rules will he be judged and condemned. The clan dynasts will demand. The clan dynasts are in no position to demand anything. The Grand Admiral barked, touching the comlink cylinder pocket beside his tunic insignia. Do you require a reminder of what it means to defy the Empire? Leia heard the faint sound of the Matrax sigh. No, my lord, she said, her voice conceding defeat. The Grand Admiral studied her. You shall have one anyway. He touched his comlink again and abruptly the interior of the Duke of Flash with a blinding burst of green light. Leia jerked her head back into Chewbacca's legs, squeezing her eyelids shut against the sudden searing pain ripping through her eyes and face. For a single horrifying second, she thought that the Duke had taken a direct hit, a turbo laser blast powerful enough to bring the whole structure down in flaming ruin around them. But the afterimage burned into her retina showed the Grand Admiral still standing proud and unmoved, and belatedly she understood. She was trying desperately to reverse her sensory enhancement when the thunderclap slammed like the slap of an angry Wookiee onto the side of her head. She would later have a vague recollection of several more turbo laser blasts seen and heard only dimly through the thick gray haze that clouded over her mind as the orbiting Star Destroyer fired again and again into the hills surrounding the village. By the time her throbbing head had finally dragged her back into full consciousness, the Grand Admiral's reminder was over, the final thunderclap rolling away into the distance. Cautiously, she opened her eyes, squinting a little against the pain. The Grand Admiral was still standing where he'd been, in the center of the Duca, and as the last thunderclap faded into silence, he spoke. I am the law on Onika now, Matrak, he said, his voice quiet and deadly. If I choose to follow the ancient laws, I will follow them. If I choose to ignore them, they will be ignored. Is that clear? 
The voice, when it came, was almost too alien to recognize. If the purpose of the Grand Admiral's demonstration had been to frighten the matriarch half out of her mind, it had clearly succeeded. Yes, my lord. Good. The Grand Admiral let the brittle silence hang in the air for another moment. For loyal servants of the Empire, however, I am prepared to make compromises. Kabarak will be interrogated aboard the Chimera, but before that, I will allow the first stage of the ancient laws of discovery. His head turned slightly. Ruck, you will remove Kabarak Clan Kimbar to the center of Nystal and present him to the Clan Dietists. Perhaps three days of public shaming will serve to remind the Nagiri people that we are still at war. Yes, my lord. There was the sound of footsteps in the opening and closing of the double doors. Hunched against the ceiling above her, his sense in unreadable turmoil, Chewbacca rumbled softly to himself. Leia clenched her teeth, hard enough to send flashes of pain through her still throbbing head. Public shaming, and something called the Laws of Discovery. The Rebel Alliance had unwittingly destroyed Onager. Now it seemed she was going to do the same to Kabarak. The Grand was still standing in the middle of the Duca. You are very quiet, Matrak, he said. My lord ordered me to be silent, she countered. Of course. He studied her. Loyalty to one's clan and family is all well and good, Matrak. But to extend that loyalty to a traitor would be foolish, as well as potentially disastrous to your family and clan. I have not heard evidence that my third son is a traitor. The Grand Admiral's lip twitched. You will. He promised softly. He walked toward the double doors, passing out of Leia's sight, and there was the sound of the doors opening. The footsteps paused, clearly waiting, and a moment later the quieter paces of the matriarch joined him. Both left, and the doors closed again, and Leia and Chewbacca were alone. Alone, in enemy territory, without a ship, and with their only ally about to undergo an imperial interrogation. I think, Chewie, she said softly, we're in trouble. Chapter 14 one of the first minor truths about interstellar flight that any observant traveler learned was that a planet seen from space almost never looked anything at all like the official maps of it. Scatterings of cloud cover, shadows from mountain ranges, contour-altering effects of large vegetation tracks, and lighting tricks in general all combined to disguise and distort the nice, clean computer scrub lines drawn by the cartographers. It was an effect that had probably caused a lot of bad moments for neophyte navigators, as well as supplying the ammunition for innumerable practical jokes played on those same neophytes by their more experienced shipmates. It was therefore something of a surprise to find that, on this particular day and coming in from this particular angle, the major continent of the planet Jomark did indeed look almost exactly like a precisely detailed map. Of course, in all fairness, it was a pretty small continent to begin with. Somewhere on that picture-perfect continent was a Jedi Master. Luke tapped his fingers gently on the edge of his control board, gazing out at the greenish-brown chunk of land now framed in his X-Wing's canopy. He could sense the other Jedi's presence, had been able to sense it, in fact, since first dropping out of hyperspace, but so far he'd been unable to make a more direct contact. Master Sabaoth? He called silently, trying one more time. This is Luke Skywalker. Can you hear me? There was no response. Either Luke wasn't doing it right, or Sebeoth was unable to reply, or else this was a deliberate test of Luke's abilities. While well, he was game. Let's do a sensor focus on the main continent, R2. He called, looking over his displays and trying to put himself into the frame of mind of a Jedi Master who had been out of circulation for a while. The bulk of Jomark's land area was in that one small continent, not much more than an oversized island, really. But there were also thousands of much smaller islands scattered in clusters around the vast ocean. Taken all together, they were probably close to 300,000 square kilometers of dry land, which made for an awful lot of places to guess wrong. Scan for technology and see if you can pick out the main population centers. R2 whistled softly to himself as he ran the X-Wing sensor readings through his programmed lifeform algorithms. He gave a series of beeps, and a pattern of dots appeared superimposed on the scope image. Thanks, Luke said, studying it. Not surprisingly, most of the population seemed to be living along the coast but there were a handful of other, smaller centers in the interior as well, including what seemed to be a cluster of villages near the southern shore of an almost perfectly ring-shaped lake. He found the image, keyed for contour overlay. It wasn't just an ordinary lake he saw now, but one that had formed inside what was left of a cone-shaped mountain, with a smaller cone making a large island in the center, probably volcanic in origin, given the mountainous terrain around it. 
a wilderness region thick with mountains, where a Jedi Master could have lived in privacy for a long time, and a cluster of villages nearby where he could have emerged from his isolation when he was finally ready to do so. It was as good a place to start as any. Okay, R2. Here's the landing target. He told the droid, marking on his scope. I'll take us down. You watch the sensors and let me know if you spot anything interesting. R2 beeped a somewhat nervous question. Yes, or anything suspicious. Luke agreed. R2 had never fully believed that the Imperial attack on them the last time they tried to come here had been purely coincidence. They dropped in through the atmosphere, switching to repulsion lifts about halfway down and leveling off just below the tops of the highest mountains. Seen up close, the territory was rugged enough, but not nearly as desolate as Luke had first thought. Vegetation was rich down in the valley areas between mountains, though it was sparse on the rocky sides of the mountains themselves. Most of the gaps they flew over seemed to have at least a couple of houses nestled into them, and occasionally even a village that had been too small for the X-Wing's limited sensors to notice. They were coming up on the lake from the southwest when R2 spotted the mansion perched up on the rim. Never seen a design like that before, Luke commented. You getting any life rings from it? R2 wobbled a moment, inconclusive. Well, let's give it a try, Luke decided, keying in the landing cycle. If we're wrong, at least it'll be a downhill walk to everywhere else. The mansion was set into a small courtyard bordered by a fence that appeared more suited for decoration than defense. Killing the X-Wing's forward velocity, he swung the ship parallel to the fence and set it down a few meters outside a single gate. He was in the process of shutting down the systems when R2's trilled warning made him look up again. Standing just outside the gate, watching them, was the figure of a man. Luke gazed at him, heart starting to beat a little harder. The man was old, obviously. The gray-white hair and the long beard that the mountain winds were blowing half across his lined face were evidence enough of that. But his eyes were keenly alert. His posture straight and proud, and unaffected by even the harder gusts of wind, and the half-open brown robe revealed a chest that was strongly muscled. Finish shutting down, R2, Luke said, hearing the slight quaver in his voice as he slipped off his helmet and popped the X-Wing's canopy. Standing up, he vaulted lightly over the cockpit side to the ground. The old man hadn't moved. Taking a deep breath, Luke walked over to him. Master Sabioff, he said, bowing his head slightly. I'm Luke Skywalker. The other smiled faintly. Yes, he said. I know. Welcome to Jomark. Thank you, Luke said, letting his breath out in a quiet sigh. At last. It had been a long and circuitous journey, what with the unscheduled stopovers at Mercur and Sluspan. But at last he made it. Savioth might have been reading his mind. Perhaps he was. I expected you long before now, he said reproachfully. Yes, sir, Luke said. I'm sorry. Circumstances lately have been rather out of my control. Why? Sabioth countered. The question took Luke by surprise. I don't understand. The other's eyes narrowed slightly. What do you mean you don't understand? He demanded. Are you or are you not a Jedi? Well, yes. Then you should be in control. Sabioth said firmly. In control of yourself. In control of the people and events around you. Always. Yes, Master. Luke said cautiously, trying to hide his confusion. The only other Jedi Master he'd ever known had been Yoda, but Yoda had never talked like this. For another moment, Sabaoth seemed to study him. Then abruptly, the hardness in his face vanished. But you've come, he said, the lines in his face shifting as he smiled. That's the important thing. They weren't able to stop you. No, Luke said. They tried, though. I must have gone through four Imperial attacks since I first started out this way. Sabioth looked at him sharply. Did you now? Were they directed specifically at you? One of them was, Luke said. For the others, I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe the right place at the right time. He corrected. The sharp look faded from Sabioth's face, replaced by something distant. Yes, he murmured, gazing into the distance toward the edge of the cliff and the ring-shaped lake far below. The wrong place at the wrong time. The epitaph of so many Jedi. He looked back at Luke. The Empire destroyed them, you know. Yes, I know, Luke said. They were hunted down by the Emperor and Darth Vader. And one or two other dark Jedi with them, Sabiel said grimly. His gaze turned inward. Dark Jedi like Vader. I fought the last of them on... 
He broke off, shaking his head slowly. So long ago. Luke nodded uncomfortably, feeling as if he was standing in loose sand. All these strange topic and mood shifts were hard to follow. A result of Sabiel's isolation? Or was this another test, this time of Luke's patience? A long time ago. He agreed. But the Jedi can live again. We have a chance to rebuild. Sabiel's attention returned to him. Your sister, he said. Yes. She'll be giving birth to Jedi twins soon. Potential Jedi, anyway. Luke said, a little surprised that Sabiel had heard about Leia's pregnancy. The New Republic's publicists had given the news wide dissemination, but he had thought Jomar too far out of the mainstream to have picked up on it. The twins are the reason I came here, in fact. No, Sabiel said. The reason you came here was because I called you. Well, yes, but... There are no buts, Jedi Skywalker. Sabiel cut him off sharply. To be a Jedi is to be a servant of the Force. I called you through the Force. And when the Force calls, you must obey. I understand. Luke nodded again, wishing that he really did. Was Sabiel just being figurative? Or was this yet another topic his training had skipped over? He was familiar enough with the general controlling aspects of the Force. They were what kept him alive every time he matched his lightsaber against blaster fire. But a little recall was something else entirely. When you say the Force calls you, Master Sabaoth, do you mean... There are two reasons why I called you. Sabaoth interrupted him again. First, to complete your training. And second, because I need your help. Luke blinked. My help? Sabiel smiled wanly, his eyes suddenly very tired. I am nearing the end of my life, Jedi Skywalker. Soon now I will be making that long journey from this life to what lies beyond. A lump caught in Luke's throat. I'm sorry, was all he could think of to say. It's the way of all life, Sabiel shrugged. For Jedi, as well as for lesser beings. Luke's memory flicked back to Yoda, lying on his deathbed in his Dagobah home, and his own feeling of helplessness that he could do nothing but watch. It was not an experience he really wanted to go through again. How can I help? He asked quietly. By learning from me, Sabael said. Open yourself to me. Absorb from me my wisdom and experience and power. In this way will you carry on my life and work. I see. Luke nodded, wondering exactly what work the other was referring to. You understand, though, that I have work of my own to do. And are you prepared to do it? Sabiel said, arching his eyebrows. Fully prepared. Or did you come here with nothing to ask of me? Well, actually, yes. Luke had to admit. I came on behalf of the New Republic to ask your assistance in the fight against the Empire. To what end? Luke frowned. He'd have thought the reason self-evident. The elimination of the Empire's tyranny. The establishment of freedom and justice for all the beings of the galaxy. Justice! Sabiel's lip twisted. Do not look to lesser beings for justice, Jedi Skywalker. He slapped himself twice in the chest, two quick movements of his fingertips. We are the true justice of this galaxy. We too, and the new legacy of Jedi that we will forge to follow us. Leave the petty battles to others, and prepare yourself for that future. I... Luke floundered, searching for a response to that. What does it your sister's unborn twins need? Sabaoth demanded. They need... Well, they're someday going to need a teacher. Luke told him, the words coming out with a strange reluctance. First impressions were always dicey, he knew, but right now he wasn't at all sure that this was the sort of man he wanted to be teaching his niece and nephew. Sabiel seemed to be too mercurial, almost on the edge of instability. It's sort of been assumed that I'd be teaching them when they're old enough, like I'm teaching Leia. The problem is that just being a Jedi doesn't necessarily mean you can be a good teacher. He hesitated. Obi-Wan Kenobi blamed himself for Vader's turn to the dark side. I don't want that to happen to Leia's children thought maybe you could teach me the proper methods of Jedi instruction. Waste of time, Sabiel said with an offhanded shrug. Bring them here. I'll teach them myself. 
Yes, Master, Luke said, picking his words carefully. I appreciate the offer, but as you said, you have your own work to do. All I really need are some pointers. And what of you, Jedi Skywalker? Sabaoth interrupted him again. Have you yourself no need of further instruction? In matters of judgment, perhaps? Luke gritted his teeth. This whole conversation was leaving him feeling a lot more transparent than he really liked. Yes, I could use more instruction in that area, he conceded. I think sometimes that the Jedi Master who taught me expected me to pick that up on my own. It's merely a matter of listening to the Force, Sabiel said briskly. For a moment his eyes seemed to unfocus, then they came back again. But come, we will go down to the villages and I will show you. Luke felt his eyebrows go up. Right now? Why not? Sabiel shrugged. I have summoned a driver. He will meet us on the road. His gaze shifted to something over Luke's shoulder. No! Stay there! He snapped. Luke turned. R2 had raised himself out of the X-Wing's droid socket and was easing his way along and was easing his way along the upper hole. That's just my droid, he told Sabaoth. He will stay where he is. Sabaoth bit out. Droids are an abomination. Creations that reason but yet are not genuinely part of the Force. Luke frowned. Droids were indeed unique in that way. There was hardly a reason to label them as abominations. But this wasn't the time or the place to argue the point. I'll go help him back into his socket. He soothed Sabaoth, hurrying back to the ship. Drawing on the Force, he leaped up to the hole beside R2. Sorry, R2, but you're going to have to stay here, he told the droid. Come on, let's get you back in. R2 beeped indignantly. I know, and I'm sorry, Luke said, herding the squat metal cylinder back to its socket. But Master Sabaoth doesn't want you coming along. You might as well wait here as on the ground. At least this way you have the X-Wing's computer to talk to. The droid warbled again, a plaintive and slightly nervous sound this time. No, I don't think there's any danger, Luke assured him. If you're worried, you can keep an eye on me through the X-Wing's sensors. He lowered his voice to a murmur. And while you're at it... I want you to start doing a complete sensor scan of the area. See if you can find any vegetation that seems to be distorted, like that twisted tree growing over the dark side cave on Dagobah. Okay? R2 gave a somewhat bemused, acknowledged beep. Good. See you later. Luke said and dropped back to the ground. I'm ready. He told Sabaoth. The other nodded. This way. He said, and strode off along the path leading downward. Luke hurried to catch up. It was, he knew, something of a long shot. Even if the spot he was looking for was within R2's sensor range, there was no guarantee that the droid would be able to distinguish healthy alien plants from unhealthy ones. But it was worth a try. Yoda, he had long suspected, had managed to stay hidden from the Emperor and Vader, only because the dark side cave near his helmet somehow shielded his own influence on the Force. For Sabio to remain unnoticed, it followed that Jomark must also have a similar focus of dark side powers somewhere. Unless, of course, he hadn't gone unnoticed. Perhaps the Emperor had known all about him, but had deliberately left him alone. Which would, in turn, imply... what? Luke didn't know, but it was something he'd better find out. They had walked no more than two hundred meters when the driver and vehicle Sabio had summoned arrived. A tall, lanky man on an old Soro sub recreational speeder bike, pulling an elaborate wheeled carriage behind it. Not much more than a converted farm cart, I'm afraid. Sabio said as he ushered Luke into the carriage and got in beside him. Most of the vehicles seemed to be made of wood, but the seats were comfortably padded. The people of Chinu built it for me when I first came to them. The driver got the vehicles turned around, no mean trick on the narrow path, and started downward. How long were you alone before that? Luke asked. Sabiel shook his head. I don't know, he said. Time was not something I was really concerned with. I lived, I thought, I meditated. That was all. Do you remember when it was you first came here? Luke persisted. After the outbound flight mission, I mean. Slowly, Sabiel turned to face him, his eyes icy. Your thoughts betray you, Jedi Skywalker, he said coldly. You seek reassurance that I was not a servant of the Emperor. Luke forced himself to meet that gaze. The master who instructed me told me that I was the last of the Jedi, he said. He wasn't counting Vader and the Emperor in that list. And you fear that I'm a dark Jedi, as they were? Are you? 
They both smiled, and to Luke's surprise, actually chuckled. It was a strange sound coming out of that intense face. Come now, Jedi Skywalker, he said. Do you really believe that Joru Sabioth, Joru Sabioth, would ever turn to the dark side? The smile faded. The Emperor didn't destroy me, Jedi Skywalker, for the simple reason that during most of his reign, I was beyond his reach, and after I returned... He shook his head sharply. There is another, you know, another besides your sister. Not a Jedi, not yet, but I've felt the ripples in the Force, rising and then falling. Yes, I know who you're talking about, Luke said. I've met her. Sabiel turned to him, his eyes glistening. You've met her? He breathed. Well, I think I have. Luke amended. I suppose it's possible there's someone else out there who... What is her name? Luke frowned, searching Sabiel's face and trying un unsuccessfully to read his sense. There was something there he didn't like at all. She called herself Mara Jade, he said. Sabiel leaned back into his seat cushions, eyes focused on nothing. Mara Jade, he repeated the name softly. Tell me more about the outbound flight project, Luke said, determined not to get dragged off the topic. You set off from Yaga Minor, remember? Searching for other life outside the galaxy. What happened to the ship and the other Jedi Masters who were with you? Sabiel's eyes took on a faraway look. They died, of course, he said, his voice distant. All of them died. I alone survived to return. He looked suddenly at Luke. It changed me, you know. I understand. Luke said quietly. So that was why Sabiel seemed so strange. Something had happened to him on that flight. Tell me about it. For a long moment, Sabiel was silent. Luke waited, jostled by the bumps as the carriage wheels ran over the uneven ground. No. Sabiel said at last, shaking his head. Not now. Perhaps later. He nodded toward the front of the carriage. We are here. Luke looked. Ahead he could see half a dozen small houses, with more becoming visible as the carriage cleared the cover of the trees. Probably fifty or so, all told. Small, neat little cottages that seemed to combine natural building elements with selected bits of more modern technology. About twenty people could be seen moving about at various tasks. Most stopped what they were doing as a speeder bike and carriage appeared. The driver pulled to roughly the center of the village and stopped in front of a throne-like chair of polished wood, protected by a small, dome-roofed pavilion. I had it brought down from the high castle, Sabiel explained, gesturing to the chair. I suspect it was a symbol of authority to the beings who carved it. What's it used for now? Luke asked. The elaborate throne seemed out of place, somehow, in such a casually rustic setting as this. It's from there that I usually give my justice to the people. Sabiel said, standing up and stepping out of the carriage. But we will not be so formal today. Come. People were still standing motionless, watching them. Luke reached out with the force as he stepped out beside Sabiel, trying to read their overall sense. It seemed expectant, perhaps a little surprised, definitely odd. There didn't seem to be any fear, but there was nothing like affection either. How long have you been coming here? Yes, Sabiel. Less than a year, Sabiel said, sitting off casually down the street. They were slow to accept my wisdom, but eventually I persuaded them to do so. The villagers are starting to return to their tasks now, but their eyes still followed the visitors. What do you mean, persuaded them? Luke asked. I showed them that it was in their best interests to listen to me. Sabiel gestured to the cottage just ahead. Reach out your senses, Jedi Skywalker. Tell me about that house and its inhabitants. It was instantly apparent what Sabiel was referring to. Even without focusing his attention on the place, Luke could feel the anger and hostility boiling out of it. There was a flicker of something like murderous intent. Uh-oh. He said. Do you think we should? Of course we should. Sabiel said. Come. He stepped up to the cottage and pushed open the door. Keeping his hand on his lightsaber, Luke followed. There were two men standing in the room, one holding a large knife toward the other, both frozen in place as they stared at the intruders. Put the knife down, Tarm, Sabiel said. Svan, you will likewise lay aside your weapon. Slowly the man with the knife laid it on the floor. The other looked at Sabiel, back at his now unarmed opponent. I said lay it aside, Sabiel snapped. The man cringed back. 
hastily pulling a small slug thrower from his pocket and dropping it beside the knife. Better, Sabiel said, his voice calm with the hint of the fire still there. Now explain yourselves. The story came out in a rush from both men at once, a loud and confusing battle of charges and countercharges about some kind of business deal gone sour. Sabiel listened silently, apparently having no trouble following the windstorm of fact and assumption and accusation. Luke waited beside him, wondering how he was ever going to untangle the whole thing. As near as he could understand it, both men seemed to have equally valid arguments. Finally, the man ran out of words. Very well, Sabiel said. The judgment of Sabioth is that Svan will pay to time the full wages agreed upon. He nodded at each man in turn. The judgment will be carried out immediately. Luke looked at Sabioth in surprise. That's all? He asked. Sabiel turned a steely gaze on him. You have something to say? Luke glanced back at the two villagers, acutely aware that arguing the ruling in front of them might undermine whatever authority Sabiel had built up here. I just thought that more of a compromise might be in order. There is no compromise to be made, Sabiel said firmly. Svan is at fault, and he will pay. Yes, but... Luke caught the flicker of sense a half-second before Span died for the slug thrower. With a single smooth motion, he had his lightsaber free of his belt and ignited. But Sabioth was faster. Even as Luke's green-white blade snapped into existence, Sabioth raised his hand, and from his fingertips flashed a sizzling volley of all-too-well-remembered blue lightning bolts. Span took the blast full on the head and chest, snapping over backwards with a scream of agony. He slammed into the ground, screaming again as Sabioth sent a second blast at him. The slug thrower flew from his hand, its metal surrounded for an instant by a blue-white coronal discharge. Sabio lowered his hand, and for a long moment the only sound in the room was a soft whimpering from the man on the floor. Luke stared at him in horror, the smell of ozone retching in his stomach. Sabio, you will dress me as... master. The other cut him off quietly. Luke took a deep breath, forcing calm into his mind and voice. Closing down his lightsaber, he returned to his belt and went over to kneel beside the groaning man. He was obviously still hurting, but aside from some angry red burns on his chest and arms, he didn't seem to be seriously hurt. Laying his hands gently on the worst of the burns, Luke reached out with the Force, doing what he could to alleviate the other's pain. Jedi Skywalker, Sabio said from behind him. He is not permanently damaged. Come away. Luke didn't move. He's in pain. That is as it should be, Sabiel said. He required a lesson, and pain is the one teacher no one will ignore. Now come away. For a moment, Luke considered disobeying. Span's face and sense were in agony. Or would you have preferred that Tom lie dead now? Sabiel added. Luke looked at the slug thrower lying on the floor, then at Tom standing stiffly with wide eyes and face the color of dirty snow. There were other ways to stop him, Luke said, getting to his feet. But none that he will remember longer. Sabiel locked eyes with Luke. Remember that, Jedi Skywalker. Remember it well. For if you allow your justice to be forgotten, you will be forced to repeat the same lessons again and again. He held Luke's gaze a pair of heartbeats longer before turning back to the door. We're finished here. Come. The stars were blazing overhead as Luke eased open the low gate of the high castle and stepped out of the courtyard. R2 had clearly noticed his approach. As he closed the gate behind him, the droid turned on the X-Wing's landing lights, illuminating his path. Hi, R2, Luke said, walking to the short ladder and wearily pulling himself up to the cockpit. I just came out to see how you and the ship were doing. R2 beeped his assurance that everything was fine. Good, Luke said, flicking on the scopes and keying for a status check anyway. Any luck with the sensor scan I asked for? The reply this time was less optimistic. That bad, huh? Luke nodded heavily as a translation of R2's answer scrolled across the X-Wing's computer scope. Well, that's what happens when you get up into mountains. R2 grunted, a distinctly enthusiastic sound, then warbled a question. I don't know. Luke told him. A few more days at least. Maybe longer if he needs me to stay. He sighed. I don't know, R2. I mean, it's just never what I expect. I went to Dagobah expecting to find a great warrior, and I found Master Yoda. I came here expecting to find someone like Master Yoda, and instead I got Master Sabaoth. 
R2 gave a slightly disparaging gurgle, and Luke had to smile at the translation. Yes, well, don't forget that Master Yoda gave you a hard time that first evening, too. He reminded the droid, wincing a little himself at the memory. Yoda had also given Luke a hard time at that encounter. It had been a test of Luke's patience and his treatment of strangers. And Luke had flunked it, rather miserably. R2 warbled a point of distinction. No, you're right. Luke had to concede. Even while he was still testing us, Yoda never had the kind of hard edge that Sabaoth does. He leaned back against his headrest, staring past the open canopy at the mountaintops and the distant stars beyond them. He was weary, wearier than he'd been, probably since the height of that last climactic battle against the Emperor. It had been all he could do to come out here to check on R2. I don't know, R2. He hurt someone today. Hurt him a lot. And he pushed his way into an argument without being invited and then forced an arbitrary judgment on the people involved, and... He waved a hand helplessly. I just can't see Ben or Master Yoda acting that way. But he's a Jedi, just like they were. So which example am I supposed to follow? The droids seemed to digest that. Then, almost reluctantly, he trilled again. That's the obvious question. Luke agreed. But why would a dark Jedi of Sabael's power bother playing games like this? Why not just kill me and be done with it? R2 gave an electronic grunt, a list of possible reasons scrolling across the screen. A rather lengthy list. Clearly the droid had put a lot of time and thought into the question. I appreciate your concern, R2. Luke soothed him. But I really don't think he's a dark Jedi. He's erratic and moody, but he doesn't have the same sort of evil aura about him that I could sense in Vader and the Emperor. He hesitated. This wasn't going to be easy to say. I think it's more likely that Master Sabaoth is insane. It was possibly the first time Luke had ever seen R2 actually startled speechless. For a minute, the only sound was the whispering of the mountain winds playing through the spindly trees surrounding the high castle. Luke stared at the stars and waited for R2 to find his voice. Eventually, the droid did. No, I don't know for sure how something like that could happen. Luke admitted as the question appeared on the screen. But I've got an idea. He reached up to lace his fingers behind his neck, the movement easing the pressure in his chest. The dull fatigue in his mind seemed to be matched by an equally dull ache in his muscles, the kind he sometimes got if he went through an overly strenuous workout. Dimly, he wondered if there was something in the air that the X-Wing's biosensors hadn't picked up on. You never knew, but right after Ben was cut down, back on the first Death Star, I found out that I could sometimes hear his voice in the back of my mind. By the time the Alliance was driven off Hoth, I could see him, too. R2 twittered. Yes, that's who I sometimes talk to on Dagobah. Who confirmed? And then right after the Battle of Endor, I was able to see not only Ben, but Yoda and my father, too. Though the other two never spoke, and I never saw them again. My guess is that there's some way for a dying Jedi to... Oh, I don't know. To somehow anchor himself to another Jedi who's close by. R2 seemed to consider that, point out a possible flaw in the reasoning. I didn't say it was the tightest theory in the galaxy. Luke growled at him. A glimmer of annoyance peeking through his fatigue. Maybe I'm way off the mark. But if I'm not, it's possible that the five other Jedi Masters from the Outbound Flight Project wound up anchored to Master Sabaoth. R2 whistled thoughtfully. Right. Luke agreed ruefully. He didn't bother me any to have been around. In fact, I wish he had talked to me more often. But Master Sabaoth was a lot more powerful than I was. Maybe it was different with him. R2 made a little moan, and another rather worried suggestion appeared on the screen. I can't just leave him, R2. Luke shook his head tiredly. Not with him like this. Not when there's a chance I can help him. He grimaced, hearing in the words a painful echo of the past. Darth Vader, too, had needed help, and Luke had similarly taken on the job of saving him from the dark side, and had nearly gotten himself killed in the process. What am I doing? He wondered silently. I'm not a healer. Why do I keep trying to be one? Luke. With an effort, Luke dragged his thoughts back to the present. I've got to go. He said, levering himself out of the cockpit seat. Master Sabioth's calling me. He shut down the displays, but not before the translation of R2's worried jabbering scrolled across the computer display. Relax, R2. Luke told him, leaning back over the open cockpit canopy to pat the droid reassuringly. I'll be all right. I'm a Jedi, remember? You just keep a good eye on things out there, okay? The droid trilled mournfully as Luke dropped down the ladder and onto the ground. He paused there, looking at the dark mansion, lit only by the backwash of the X-Wing's landing lights, wondering if maybe R2 was right about them getting out of here. Because the droid had a good point. 
Luke's talents didn't lean toward the healing aspects of the Force. That much he was sure of. Helping save Ilk was going to be a long, time-consuming process, with no guarantee of success at the end of the road. With a Grand Admiral in command of the Empire, political infighting in the New Republic, and the whole galaxy hanging in the balance, was this really the most efficient use of his time? He raised his eyes from the mansion to the dark shadows of the Rim Mountains surrounding the lake below. Snow-capped in places, barely visible in the faint light of Jomark's three tiny moons, they reminiscent somehow of the Minari Mountains south of the Imperial City on Coruscant. And with that memory came another one, Luke, standing on the Imperial Palace rooftop gazing at those other mountains. Sagely explained to Freepil that a Jedi couldn't get so caught up in galactic matters that he was no longer concerned about individual people. The speech had sounded high and noble when he'd given it. This was his chance to prove that it hadn't been just words. Taking a deep breath, he headed back toward the gate. Chapter 15 Tangreen was our real crowning achievement, Senator Bel Iblis said, draining the last of his glass and raising it high above his head. Across the expansive but largely empty headquarters lounge, the bartender nodded in silent acknowledgement and busied himself with his drink dispenser. We've been sniping at the Imperials for probably three years at that point, Bel Iblis continued, hitting small bases and military supply shipments and generally making as much trouble for them as we could. But up until Tangreen, they weren't paying much attention to us. What happened at Tangreen? Han asked. We blasted a major ubiquitor center into fine powder. Bel Iblis told him with obvious satisfaction. And then waltzed stout right under the collective nose of the three star destroyers that were supposed to be guarding the place. I think that was when they finally woke up to the fact that we were more than just a minor irritant. That we were a group to be taken seriously. Oh, I'll bet they did. Han agreed, shaking his head in admiration. Even getting within inside sight of one of the Imperial's ubiquitous bases was a tricky job, let alone blasting it and getting out again. What did it cost you? Amazingly enough, we got all five warships out, Bel Iblis said. There was a fair amount of damage all around, of course. And one of them was completely out of commission for nearly seven months. But it was worth it. I thought you said you had six dreadnoughts. Lando spoke up. We have six now. Bellblis nodded. At the time, we only had five. Ah. Lando said and laughed back into silence. So after that was when you started moving your base around? Han asked. Bellblis eyed Lando a moment longer before turning back to Han. It was when mobility became a top priority, yes. He corrected. Though we hadn't exactly been seen still before that. This place is, what, our thirteenth location in seven years, Sina? Fourteenth, Senna said. That's if you count Warmerick and the Matri asteroid bases. Fourteen, then. Bellblis nodded. You probably notice every building here is built of bi-state memory plastic. Makes it relatively simple to fold everything up and toss it aboard the transports. He chuckled. Though that's been known to backfire on us. Once on Lelmarrow, we got hit by a violent thunderstorm, and the lightning strikes were hitting so close to us that the edge currents triggered the flip-flop on a couple of barracks buildings and a targeting center. Folded them up neat as a set of birthday presents with nearly 50 people still inside. That was terrific fun, Senna put in dryly. No one was killed, fortunately, but it took us the better part of the night cutting them all free, with the storm still blazing all around us. Things finally quieted down just before daylight, that Iblis said. We were out of there by the next evening. Ah. The bartender had arrived with the next round of drinks. Twizzlers, Bellibus had called them. A brand of Corellian brandy with some unidentified but very tart fruit extract. Not the sort of drink Han would have expected to find in a military camp, but not bad either. The senator took two of the drinks off the tray and handed them across to Han and Senna. Took the other two off. I'm still good, thanks. Lando said before Bellibus could offer him one. Han frowned across the table at his friend. Lando was sitting stiffly in his lounge chair, his face impassive, his glass still half full. His first glass, Han realized. Lando hadn't had a refill in the hour and a half since Bellblis had brought them here. He caught Lando's eye, raised his eyebrows fractionally. Lando looked back, his expression still stony, then dropped his gaze and took a small sip of his drink. It was about a month after Tangreen, Bellblis went on, that we first met Borsk Felia. Han turned back to him, feeling a twitch of guilt. He'd gotten so wrapped up in Bel Iblis' storytelling that he'd completely forgotten why he and Lando had set off on this mission in the first place. Probably that was what had Lando glaring crushed ice in his direction. 
Yeah, Felia. He said. What's your deal with him? Considerably less of a deal than he'd like, I assure you. Baobla said. Felia did us some favors during the height of the war years. He seems to think we should be more grateful for them. What sort of favors? Lando asked. Small ones. Baobla told him. Early on, he helped us set up a supply line through New Cove, and he whistled up some star cruisers once when the Imperials started nosing around the system at an awkward moment. He and some of the other Bothans also shifted various funds to us, which enabled us to buy equipment sooner than we otherwise would have. That sort of thing. So how grateful are you? Lendo persisted. Bell Ibla smiled slightly. Or in other words, what exactly does Phalia want from me? Lando didn't smile back. That'll do for starters. He agreed. Lando. Han said warningly. No, that's all right. Belobus said, his own smile fading. Before I answer, though, I'd like you to tell me a little about the New Republic hierarchy, Mon Mothma's position in the new government, Thalia's relationship to her, that sort of thing. Han shrugged. That's pretty much public record. That's the official version. Belobus said. I'm asking what things are really like. Han glanced over at Lando. I don't understand, he said. But Iblis took a swallow of his Twistler. Well, oh, then let me be more direct, he said, setting the liquid in his glass. What's Mon Mothma really up to? Han felt a trickle of anger in his throat. Is that what Bralia told you? He demanded. That she's up to something? But Iblis raised his eyes over the rim of his glass. This has nothing to do with the Bothans, he said quietly. It's about Mon Mothma, period. Han looked back at him, forcing down his confusion as he tried to collect his thoughts. There were things he didn't like about Mon Mothma. A lot of things, when you came right down to it. Starting with the way she kept running Leia off her feet doing diplomacy stuff instead of letting her concentrate on her Jedi training. And there were other things, too, that drove him crazy. But when you came right down to it... As far as I know... He told Bell Iblis evenly. The only thing she's trying to do is put together a new government. With herself at its head? Shouldn't she be? A shadow of something seemed to cross Bell Iblis's face, and he dropped his eyes to his glass again. I suppose it was inevitable, he murmured. For a moment he was silent. Then he looked up again, seeming to shake himself out of the mood. So you'd say that you're becoming a republic in fact as well as in name? I'd say that, yes. Han nodded. What does this have to do with Phalia? Bell Iblis shrugged. It's Phalia's belief that Mon Mothman wields altogether too much power, he said. I presume you disagree with that assessment? Han hesitated. I don't know. He conceded. But she sure isn't running the whole show like she did during the war. The war's still going on. Oh, uh, Iblis reminded him. Yeah, well, what does Phalia think ought to be done about it? Lando spoke up. Oh, uh, Iblis' lip twitched. Oh, Phalia has some rather personal and highly unsurprising ideas about the reapportionment of power. But that's Bothans for you. Give them a sniff of the soup pot and they climb all over each other to be in charge of the ladle. Especially when they can claim to have been valued allies of the winning side. Lando said. Unlike others, I could mention. Senna stirred in her seat, but before she could say anything, Bell Iblis waved a hand at her. You're wondering why I didn't join the Alliance, he said calmly. Why I chose instead to run my own private war against the Empire. That's right, Lando said, matching his tone. I am. Bell Iblis gave him a long, measuring look. I could give you several reasons why I felt it was better for us to remain independent. He said at last. Security, for one. There was a great deal of communication going on between various units of the Alliance, with a correspondingly large potential for interception of that information by the Empire. For a while, it seemed like every fifth rebel base was being lost to the Imperials through sheer sloppiness and security. We had some problems. Han conceded. But they've been pretty well fixed. Have they? Bell Iblis countered. What about this information leak I understand you have right in the Imperial Palace? Yeah, we know it's there. Han said, feeling strangely like a kid who's been called on the carpet for not finishing his homework. We've got people looking into it. They'd better do more than just look. Bell Iblis warned. If our analysis of Imperial Communique is correct, this leak has its own name, Delta Source, and is furthermore reporting personally to the Grand Admiral. Okay, Lando said. Security. Let's hear some of the other reasons. He's off, Lando, Han said, glaring across the table at his friend. This isn't a trial, or... He broke off at a gesture from Bell Iblis. 
Thank you, Solo, but I'm quite capable of defending my own actions. The center said. And I'll be more than happy to do so, when I feel the time is right for such a discussion. He looked at Lando, then at his watch. But right now I have other duties to attend to. It's getting late, and I know you really haven't had time to relax since landing. Irones has had your baggage taken to a vacant officer's efficiency back toward the landing pad. It's small, I'm afraid, but I trust you'll find it comfortable enough. He stood up. Perhaps later over dinner we can continue this discussion. Han looked at Lando. Such convenient timing, the other's expression said, but he kept the thoughts to himself. Sounds fine. Han told Bell Elbus for both of them. Good. Bell Elbus smiled. I'll need Senna with me, but we'll point you in the direction of your quarters on our way out. Unless you'd rather I assign you a guide. We can find it. Han assured him. All right. Someone will come to get you for dinner. Until later, then. They walked in silence, or probably half the distance to their quarters before Lando finally spoke. You want to go ahead and get it over with? Get what over with? Han growled. Chewing me out for not bowing and scraping in front of your pal, the senator. Lando said. Do it and get it over with, because we have to talk. Han kept his eyes straight ahead. You weren't just not bowing and scraping, pal. He bit out. I've seen Chewie in a bad mood be more polite than you were back there. You're right. Lando acknowledged. You want to be mad a little longer, or are you ready to hear my reasons? Oh, this should be interesting. Han said sarcastically. You've got a good reason to be rude to a former Imperial Senator, huh? He's not telling the truth, Han. Lando said earnestly. Not the whole truth, anyway. So? Han said. Who says he has to tell strangers everything? He brought us here. Lendo countered. Why do that and then lie to us about it? Han frowned sideways at his friend, and through his annoyance he saw that for the first time the tension lines in Lando's face. Whatever Lando was reaching for here, he was serious about it. Okay. He said a little more calmly. What did he lie about? This camp for starters. Lendo said, gesturing toward the nearest building. The Xander said they move around a lot. Fourteen sites in seven years, remember? But this place has been here a lot longer than half a year. Han looked at the buildings as they passed it, at the smoothness of the edges where the memory plastic would fold up, at the signs of wear in the sub-foundation. There are other things, too. Lando went on. That headquarters lounge back there. Did you notice all the decoration they had in that place? Probably a dozen sculptures scattered around on those corner ledges between the booths, plus a lot of light poles. And that doesn't even count all the stuff on the walls. There was a whole antique repeater display panel mounted over the main bar, a ship's chrono next to the exit. I was there too, remember? Han cut him off. What's your point? My point is that this place isn't ready to pack up and ship off planet in three minutes' notice. Lando said quietly. Not anymore. And you don't get this soft and comfortable if you're still in the business of launching major attacks against Imperial bases. Maybe they decided to lie low for a while. Han said. This business of having to defend Bell Iblis was starting to feel uncomfortable. Could be, Lando said. In that case, the question is why? What else could he be holding his ships and troops back for? Han chewed at the inside of his cheek. He saw where Lando was going with this, all right. You think he's made a deal with Felia? That's the obvious answer, Lando agreed soberly. You heard how he talked about Mon Mothma, like he expected her to declare herself emperor any day now. Felia's influence? Han thought it over. It was still crazy, but not nearly as crazy as it had seemed at first blush. Though if Thalia thought he could stage a coup with six private dreadnoughts, he was in for a rude surprise. But on the other hand... Wait a minute, Lando, this is crazy. He said. If they're plotting against Mon Mothma, why bring us here? Lando hissed softly between his teeth. Well, that brings us to the worst case scenario, huh, old buddy? Namely, that your friend the senator is a complete phony, and that what we've got here is a giant imperial scam. Han blinked. Now you've lost me. Think about it. Lando urged, lowering his voice as a group of uniformed men rounded a corner of one of the buildings and headed off in another direction. Garmbel Iblis, supposedly killed, suddenly returned from the dead, and not only alive, but with his own personal army on top of it, an army that neither of us have ever heard of? Yeah, but Bell Iblis wasn't exactly a recluse. Han pointed out. There were a lot of hollows and recordings of him when I was growing up. You'd have to go to a lot of effort to look and sound that much like him. 
If you had those records handy to compare him with, sure. Lando agreed. But all you've got is memories. It wouldn't take that much effort to rig a fairly close copy. And we know that this base has been sitting here for more than a year, maybe abandoned by someone else, and it wouldn't take much effort to throw a fake army together. Not for the Empire. Han shook his head. You're skating on drive trails, Lando. The Empire's not going to go to this much effort just for us. Maybe they didn't, Lando said. Maybe it was for Phalia's benefit, and we just happened to stumble in on it. Han frowned. Phalia's benefit? Sure, Lando said. Start with the Empire gimmicking Akbar's bank account. That puts Akbar under suspicion and ripe for someone to push him off his perch. Enter Phalia, convinced that he's got the support of the legendary Garm Bel Iblis and a private army behind him. Phalia makes his bid for power. The New Republic hierarchy is thrown into a tangle. And while no one's watching, the Empire moves in and takes back a sector or two. Quick, clean, and simple. Han started under his breath. That's what you call simple, huh? We're dealing with a Grand Admiral, Han. Lando reminded him. Anything is possible. Yeah, well, possible doesn't mean likely. Han countered. If they're running a con game, why would they bring us here? Why not? Our presence doesn't hurt the plan any. Might even help it a little. They show us the setup, send us back, we blow the whistle on failure, and Mon Mothma pulls back ships to protect Coruscant from a coup attempt that never materializes. More chaos, and even more unprotected sectors for the Imperials to gobble up. Han shook his head. I think you're jumping at shadows. Maybe. Lando said darkly. And maybe you're putting too much trust in the ghost of a Corellian senator. They had reached their quarters now, one of a double row of small square buildings about small square buildings each about five meters on a side. Han keyed in the lock combination Senna had given them, and they went inside. The apartment was about as stark and simple as it could be while still remaining even halfway functional. It consisted of a single room with a compact cooking niche on one side and a door leading to what was probably a bathroom on the other. A brown fold-down table-slash-console combo and two old-fashioned contour chairs upholstered in military gray, upholstered in military gray occupied much of the space, with the cabinets of what looked like two fold-down beds positioned to take up the table's share of the floor space at night. Cozy, Lando commented. Probably can be packed up and shipped off planet on three minutes' notice, too, Han said. I agree, Lando nodded. This is exactly the sort of feel that Lounge should have had, only it didn't. Maybe they figure they ought to have at least one building around here that didn't look like it came out of the Clone Wars. Han suggested. Maybe. Lando said, squatting down beside one of the chairs and peering at the edge of the seat cushion. Probably pulled them out of that dreadnought up there. Experimentally, he dug his fingers under the great material. Looks like they didn't even add any extra padding before they reupholstered them with this. He broke off, and abruptly his face went rigid. What is it? Han demanded. Slowly, Lando turned to look up at him. This chair, he whispered. It's not gray underneath. It's blue gold. Okay? Han said, frowning. So? You don't understand. The fleet doesn't do the interiors of military ships in blue gold. They've never done them in blue gold. Not under the Empire, not under the New Republic, not under the Old Republic. Except one time. Which was? Han prompted. Lando took a deep breath. The Katana Fleet. Han stared at him, an icy feeling digging up under his breastbone. The Katana Fleet. That can't be right, Lando. He said. Got to be a mistake. No mistake, Han. Lando shook his head. Digging his fingers in harder, he lifted the edge of the gray covering high enough to show the material beneath it. I once spent two whole months researching the Dark Force. This is it. Han gazed at the aged old blue-gold blue cloth, a sense of unreality creeping over him. The Katana Fleet, the Dark Force, lost for half a century, and now suddenly found. Maybe. We need something better in the way of proof, he told Lando. This doesn't do it by itself. Lando nodded, still in half shock. That would explain why they kept us aboard the Lady Luck the whole way here, he said. They'd never be able to hide the fact that their dreadnought was running with only 2,000 crewers instead of the normal 16. The Katana Fleet. We need to get a look inside one of the ships. Han persisted. That recognition code Iron has sent. I don't suppose you made a recording of it? Lando took a deep breath and seemed to snap out of it. We can probably reconstruct it, he said. 
but if they've got any sense, their code for getting in won't be the same as their code for getting out. But I don't think we have to get aboard the ships themselves. All I need is a good, close look at that repeater display panel back in the headquarters lounge. Okay. Han nodded grimly. Let's go and get you that look. We're sorry. We chose to record this on a day where there's a lot of snow outside and everyone just decided to plow the crap out of our cul-de-sac all at once. <laughs> we apologize for any uh, random background noise you might hear. That's just the fact that our cul-de-sac is haunted because every time I look out the window, I don't see the plows. I don't see the people. I don't to uh, figure out where the music is coming from. I don't even know how I am hearing a cat meow. The shuttle must already be in sight beneath the clouds. Leo. <gasps> Hold on. Anyway. Clouds. <laughs> clouds. Clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should tone down Samuel's uh, voice a little bit. Mm, mm, I mean, it's a great voice, mm, but I don't want you to destroy your throat. Like, damn! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you want me to get you more water real quick? <laughs> it's a great voice. It is a great voice. He really sounds like a man who would activate his lightsaber on his own nephew. No. Say Bailiff? No, Luke. No. It's a joke. Get it. Right. Get it? Yes. He totally sounds like someone who would turn his lightsaber on. Oh, his yeah, nephew. totally. Totally. 